To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this era for the care of their land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank all of you for joining our discussions today, and for all you Star Wars fans out there, may the fourth be with you. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Martin Vorda, who will be presenting on spirochete load in the host and tick is critical for transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi sensoleto. Dr. Vorda's research interests include the ecology of Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections. Dr. Vorda did his Bachelor of Science and PhD in biology at the University of Victoria in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. His first postdoc was on the ecological immunology of malaria mosquitoes in England. His second postdoc was on the ecology of Lyme disease at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in the United States, where he was introduced to the world of ticks and tick-borne diseases. From 2018 to, sorry, from 2011 to 2018, he was the assistant professor at the University of New Chattel in New Chattel, Switzerland, where his research was focused on the ecology of European Lyme disease bacteria including Borrelia afzelia and Borrelia grinii. In 2018, he started his professorship at the Department of Veterinary Microbiology, Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. His research is currently focused on three themes. One, variation in pathogen life history traits among strains of Borrelia burgdorferi. Second, co-infections interactions between strains. And finally, the ability uh, of maternal antibodies to protect offsprings from infection. You will, we will have Dr. Vardot present and then we will open for questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering them in the chat box or you can raise your high ends icon uh, during the uh, talk after we read off the uh, questions from the chat box. Please help us welcome Dr. Vardot to the podium. Uh, great. Thank you, Veronica. Can you see my presentation? I can see it, but it's not in uh, your presentation mode. It just shows. Yeah, there we go. We're good to go. Great. Okay. Um, well, thanks uh, very much for that introduction. Thanks to the uh, Fidern Committee that organizes Canadian Lyme Disease Awareness Month to invite me to talk about my research. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work that I did uh, during my time in Switzerland and also some of the work that we've done um, since coming back to Canada here at the University of Saskatchewan. <clears throat> and so just to uh, get started here, I know many of you are, are I'm sure, familiar uh, with the biology of Lyme disease, but uh, probably useful to have a quick recap. So uh, the disease is caused by spirochete bacteria that belong to the Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato genospecies complex. Um, these spirochetes are transmitted among uh, vertebrate hosts by ticks that belong to the genus Ixodes. So uh, here in, in North America, we have the, the black-legged tick and the Western black-legged tick in Europe. They have, uh, in Asia, they have other tick species. And these ticks are responsible for transmitting the pathogen to vertebrate hosts. Uh, which uh, incl can include a wild variety of wildlife. And of course, uh, humans are um, get Lyme disease. They are accidental hosts. They're not, they not the intended host of the pathogen. So the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, was discovered in 1982 by uh, Willy Burgdorfer. Um, but since then, we've discovered that there are many different uh, spirochete bacteria that are um, similar that belong to this group. So the, the diversity uh, that we've discovered just keeps expanding. And so uh, you can use the word species or, or genospecies to denote that diversity. And I have highlighted three here, which are uh, the most important causes of Lyme disease in Europe and North America. So in North America, we have Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, which is responsible for most cases of Lyme disease in Canada and the United States. That species also exists in Europe, but there's two other species that are actually more important, uh, Borrelia afzelii and Borrelia grinii. And I, I should point out that not all the species that are listed here uh, have been associated with uh, human uh, cases of Lyme disease. <clears throat> 
So a little bit more about this diversity of these Borrelia species. What's interesting, and, and again, this is more uh, the, the Euro European situation, but when you start looking at it, you see that certain Borrelia genus species are associated with different vertebrate hosts. So for example, Borrelia zelii, which we don't have in, in Canada or the USA, and Borrelia bavariensis, both of them uh, seem to do very well in rodents and also insectivores, so uh, things like shrews. Uh, in contrast, there's two other species that are quite common in Europe, which are called Borrelia gerenii and Borrelia valasiana. And those two species we mostly find in birds. Finally, there's a, uh, just a, for a bit more variety, there's a species called Borrelia lusitania that's been discovered fairly recently in Europe. And that one is associated with lizards. Um, and the, the mechanistic basis of this host specificity appears to be the complement system. So the complement system is part of the innate immune system of the vertebrate host. It can kill uh, Borrelia spirochetes um, shortly after a tick inoculates the spirochetes into a host. And so different Borrelia genome species seems to have evolved different uh, uh, genes for dealing with the complement system of different hosts. They bypass the, they have the ability to bypass the complement system, but they can't, they can't do it at all vertebrate hosts. They've specialized on certain ones. So that uh, at some level explains the complement system uh, explains some of this diversity at the genome species level. But that's actually not what I'm going to be talking about today. What you see next is if you focus on any particular Borrelia genome species, whether that's of Zellii or Bavariensis or Grinii, you see what I refer to as strain diversity within the genome species. And here, uh, strains are um, classified according to a multi locus sequence typing system that's been a, in effect since about 2008. Um, it's based on eight housekeeping loci that are uh, found on the chromosome. But the, the, the main point here, again, that I'm making is within every Borrelia genome species, there is this uh, strain diversity. And so we can ask again the question, where does that diversity come from? So there's sort of two uh, different explanations that have been um, advanced in the literature. One is called the multiple niche polymorphism hypothesis. That's actually very similar to the explanation that I just gave to you as to why the Borrelia genome species have diversified. And that is that these different strains are adapted to different hosts. And that idea has gotten quite a bit of currency in North America because Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto is our main species. And it is found in so many hosts. It's found in birds, it's found in rodents, it's found in uh, insectivores, uh, small carnivores. So uh, it, it would, you know, it's sort of natural that, that North American scientists started thinking, well, maybe these, these different strains are adapted to different vertebrate hosts. The other idea that's been put out there um, is the antigenic differentiation hypothesis. And so there the idea is that the immune system of the vertebrate host has been, uh, ha has been selecting for this diversity of strains. And so here the idea is that the strains really all use the same basic set of hosts, but it's the immune system that's selecting for this uh, diversity. And usually this is not a, this is not just restricted to the Lyme disease pathogen. This is a common phenomenon for many different pathogens. So, you know, the host will develop a strong antibody response, often against certain antigens or proteins that are particularly important for the pathogen life cycle that are usually uh, on the surface, usually expressed early on in infection. Uh, and then as the, the host population builds up immunity, right, the pathogens are more likely to encounter hosts that already have developed uh, immunity against them, have developed antibodies. And so those, those immunodominant antigens or proteins that are being targeted by that host antibody response, they're then under strong selection to change. And, and many of us are now familiar with this notion because of COVID, right? We know that uh, there, there has been constant evolution in the, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus that it's now evolving to our immunity, to the vaccines and so on. But this goes on for all pathogens all the time. And so for Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, um, one protein that is uh, believed to be particularly important in this regard is outer 
outer surface protein C. Uh, so it's this highly variable, we can say polymorphic, and then immunodominant antigen. So it really sort of uh, attracts the attention of the host immune response that has diversified in response to this sort of never ending attack uh, by antibodies from the host immune response. So the idea then that we have is that these different strains that have these different variants of the OSC protein, they're trying to create what I refer to as uh, their own unique ecological niche. Because So you wanna be different enough from all the other OSC variants that are out there so that you're not bothered by the antibody responses that are being developed to those other OSC proteins. And that's when we analyze the OSC uh, uh, gene and protein and the variation uh, that, that seems to be uh, the case. So, so all of these different OSCE variants seem to be uh, different enough so that they don't really uh, interfere with um, each other's uh, um, antibody responses. So at that point, they're sort of independent from one another, uh, and they can cycle uh, in the same uh, host population. Okay, so those are the two sort of uh, stock explanations for why we have the strain diversity between uh, within the Borrelia uh, genome species. But what I'm going to talk about today is that when we look at those strains, when we look at the, and we usually find quite a high strain diversity in a small geographic area, we see that there's a lot of variation. So this is from a long-term study that I did with my PhD student Jonas Durand in uh, Switzerland, and here we're looking at Borrelia zelia again. That's remember, that's that rodent specialist. And we had uh, data from 11 years that have been collected by my colleague from a small patch of forest. And we did uh, some next generation sequencing to determine the strain diversity in these ticks that have been collected over a, a, a time of about 11 years. And here, the letters on the bottom refer to the different OSC types. That's how we classified the strains. And you can see that this one strain, A10, which is uh, on the far right, uh, is way more common than, say, strain A3. So if you work, it's about 12 times more common. And so an obvious question to ask is why? Why are some strains, you know, uh, seem to be so much more successful than others? And that's sort of been a, a big question in, in our research program is to try and uh, answer that question. And there's relevance to it because you know, strains that are more common are probably more likely to end up uh, in people, right, and causing, uh, causing sickness in human patients. So um, perhaps also useful for uh, just a quick reminder of the Lyme disease uh, life cycle, because we're going to be talking about transmission today. So uh, we start here with a female tick laying eggs. Those eggs are typically uninfected. They hatch into larvae. The larvae will feed on an infected reservoir host, in this case, a mouse, and they will acquire the infection, right? And that's the first critical uh, transmission step. That's from an infected host to a larval tick. This larval tick will then molt into a nymph, and that can take quite a bit of time, and the nymph might start looking for its blood meal uh, usually a year later, so they can be separated in time. And then this nymph will feed on the next generation of reservoir hosts, which are typically naive. So this is then the second step of transmission where the nymph transmits the spirochete to the mouse. So there's these two really critical uh, transmission steps. After that, the nymph with its blood meal molts into adults and adults typically feed on deer, uh, also on people obviously. So it's important for disease transmission to people but it's not important for maintaining the spirochete in nature because deer interestingly are resistant to spirochetes. So that their complement system so it kills the spirochetes um, as they're inoculated into the animal. So it's really the larvae and the nymphs that are responsible for maintaining Lyme disease in nature. And so remember that the larvae, they acquire the infection and the nymphs, they give it back to the vertebrate host. And so here uh, I've got an equation uh, that shows all of the different things that are required for Lyme disease to spread in a place uh, and um, the epidemiologists, they like to use this concept of the reproduction number, which is abbreviated as R0. And again, because we're all, uh, we've lived through this time of COVID, many of us have probably heard of R0. So when you talk about a directly transmitted disease like uh, uh, COVID, then it means the number of uh, secondary infections that are caused by 
if a single person is infected and that person is in a population of completely susceptible individuals. So that's, that's called R0. And it's a measure of fitness. It's a measure of the likeliness that the pathogen will spread. So some pathogens are very high r naught, so like pathogens like measles have an r naught of 10 and uh, other pathogens uh, like Ebola have a, you know, an r naught of 1.2. Now r naught for tick-borne or, or vector-borne pathogens is a little trickier to, to express because you have to keep track of both the vector, the, the, the arthropod vector and the vertebrate host. So that's what this equation is trying to do at some point. And I've color coded here the, the, the different variables. Uh, some are in blue, some are in black, some are in red. Uh, but basically, R0 needs to be bigger than one in order for an infectious disease to spread. And so you want all these things in your numerator to be big and the things in the denominator uh, to be uh, a little smaller. So the things that are in blue are things that are associated with the tick. So N is the number of ticks. F is the uh, probability that a tick will feed on the host. Then there's the little p is the daily survival probability of the tick. F is the fecundity, the number of eggs that a female tick will lay. So these are all features that belong to the tick. Uh, and Borrelia, the Lyme disease pathogen, doesn't have that much control over, over those variables, those parameters. In black, I've got factors that are more host related. So it's host density. There's a recovery rate. So you know how quickly does the host uh, clear the infection, that, that also has a little bit to do with the bacteria, uh, but I've color-coded it black here, and then the daily mortality rate of the infected host. Here in red are three variables uh, that we typically see as being, you know, under control of, of the pathogen to some degree. And so here are these critical transmission steps again. So we have uh, the beta in, in these kinds of models is typically used for a transmission. So beta HT refers to transmission from the infected host to the tick. Remember, that's the larval tick. This third term here uh, would be infection, uh, transmission from the infected nymph, infected tick, to the host. And then this middle one is, we refer to that as transstadial transmission because when a larva acquires the infection, it actually has to, remember, it has to molt into an nymph and maintain the infection, right? If it loses it, uh, then it's not gonna work. Uh, but that is generally very high for Borrelia pathogens in um, uh, Ixodes ticks. But so we're, I'm gonna be talking today about these two critical transmission steps, uh, transmissions from the host to the tick and back again from the tick to the host. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm summarizing here what I've already said. So we're gonna talk about step one, host to tick transmission. Uh, which is uh, spirochete transmissions from an infected vertebrate host to naive Ixodes larvae. And then step two is transmissions from an infected Ixodes nymph to a naive vertebrate host. And again, uh, these two transmission steps are absolutely critical for the maintenance of Lyme disease in nature and indeed for any vector-borne disease. Any vector-borne disease, whether you're talking about malaria uh, or Lyme disease or babesiosis or whatever, they have to worry about the pathogen has to you know, maximize these two steps. So uh, at this point, it might be useful to talk a little bit about how do we, how do we quantify uh, transmission? Um, so first we'll talk about host to tick transmission. So how do we quantify that? Well, there's very well developed methods that, that scientists studying tick-borne diseases have, have developed for that. So you have to uh, start with a host of interest in this case, a mouse, you have to experimentally infect it with your pathogen of interest, in this case, Borrelia burgdorferi. And then we have to take larval ticks that we know are uninfected and feed them on the mice. And then uh, you see here that this is when the larvae becomes engorged. So it's still uh, pretty small, but a, a lot easier to spot now. Uh, and then what we typically do, so we collect the larvae, and we allow them to molt into nymphs. And again, that's critical because remember the nymph is the, is the most important epidemiological stage, right? That's what's gonna give it back to, to, to hosts, including people. So that's how we can measure transmission. And you might think, well, if the mouse is infected and larvae feed on it, doesn't every uh, tick become infected that feeds on that mouse? No, that's actually not the case. And there can be a lot of variation in that. And we're interested in that because maybe some of that variation could explain why some strains are more common than others. So that's, that's an, so you have an idea now how we measure host to tick transmission. 
Now, what factors influence hosts to tick transmission? Well, I haven't mentioned this yet, but most competent reservoir hosts like rodents, they don't clear the infection. Uh, they stay infected for life. But what we do tend to see is that transmission will often decline over time. So that suggests that the immune system is doing something there. It's either the rodent's immune system is reducing uh, uh, or, or attacking the, the spirochetes. Uh, but another potential explanation is that we know that some vertebrate hosts are pretty good at developing immunity against ticks. So in Europe, the bankful, uh, if you repeatedly feed the tick that they have over there on the bankful, the feeding success decreases uh, with successive feeding. So that's also going to influence uh, transmission. And an obvious thing to look at, you know, when I say what could influence transmission success from an infected host to uh, feeding ticks is the abundance of the pathogen in the tissues. Uh, this might seem very obvious. Uh, so I'm saying that if the, the pathogen is more abundant in the tissues of the, of the rodent host, uh, it's going to have better transmission to ticks. Uh, so that, that seems quite obvious, but uh, there's surprisingly few studies that have looked at that in, in any detail. So that's what uh, I'm going to talk about here now. It was a study that was done by my PhD student, uh, Chris Sink. You'll see a picture of him, I think, in the next slide. Uh, and we use this comparative uh, approach, kind of an old-fashioned approach. It's the same, same thing that Charles Darwin used. Uh, but so, what, what, and here what we're going to do is we're going to compare strains and we're going to compare their life history traits. And when I use the word life history trait, I mean things like, you know, host to tick transmission, uh, nymph to host transmission, um, the, the abundance of the pathogen uh, in the tissues of the rodent host. And in some cases, I'm not, not going to talk about it today, uh, pathology, how much, how much damage the, the pathogen does to the host. Uh, so yeah, the, and I've got them listed here. So these are the things that we're going to, oops, we're going to be talking about is uh, abundance in mouse tissues, percentage of infected larvae, uh, after feeding on an infected mouse, and then the, per the, the percentage of nymphs that fed as larvae on those mice that have the infection. It's a little bit of a mouthful to say that, uh, and I'm going to refer that shorthand as lifetime host to tick transmission. So what did we do? Uh, well, Chris experimentally infected mice via tick bite with 11 different strains of Borrelia burgdorferi in a controlled laboratory setting, and then we measured these traits. And the, uh, the idea of the project was if we could investigate the relationships between these different, what I call pathogen life history traits to get a better understanding of how natural selection shapes the life history of Borrelia burgdorferi. So here are the 11 strains that we worked with. We got them from the Public Health Agency of Canada. They had been previously isolated from field collected ticks. Um, you don't need to memorize any of this. Uh, I, I want to point out that about half the ticks came from Manitoba. The other half came from Nova Scotia. The reason we did that is we were interested to see whether there was a difference uh, between eastern strains and western strains. That, that didn't turn out to be the case, so I'm not going to be talking about that. Uh, and we did some genetic characterization, and actually the Public Health Agency of Canada had obtained whole genome sequences for these strains. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea that they were uh, clonal. It's not a mixture of a bunch of different strains. And that was quite important to us. So these are the 11 strains uh, that we worked with. Uh, so here's a picture of Chris, the, the PhD student that did all of this work uh, together with my uh, technician, Preso Ravindran Tampi. Um, and so the basic outline is the mice were infected. And then remember, the key is we want to measure host to tick transmission over the lifetime of the infection. So what Chris and Presob did is they infested these mice at 30 days post-infection, then again at 60 days post-infection and 90 days post-infection with Exodes scapularis larvae, right? So the mice were infested on three separate occasions, and then those larvae were collected. They were allowed to molt into nymphs. And then those uh, nymphs were tested to determine whether they were infected with the Borrelia pathogen or not. And we actually also collected when the larvae would drop off, the engorged larvae drop off, we would also test a subset of them, whether they were infected or not. So that's sort of the, the basic experimental setup. Uh, and then at about 100 days post-infection, all the mice were euthanized. And at that point, we dissected their organs and um, 
tested, again, using quantitative PCR, what is the abundance of the spirochetes in those tissues? And that's critical because we wanna see whether there's a relationship between the abundance in the mouse tissues and uh, transmission success. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some, some results. Uh, so first of all, uh, this slide shows that there was variation in spirochete load or abundance of the bacterium in the tissues of the mice. And we looked at seven different tissues, the heart, bladder, skin, joint, uh, ear, and so on. And here we're just averaging all of that information together. Uh, and so on the x-axis, you see the different strains. Those are the labels of the strains. And on the y-axis, we have the mouse tissue spirochete load. So, you know, the, the number of uh, spirochetes per unit of mouse tissue. And so you can see that there's uh, variation among uh, strains. So that was important uh, because if there's no variation, then, um, you know, everything else is not really going to work out. So good. Some strains establish high abundance in lab mice. Some strains establish much lower abundance. Um, next is we wanted to see, okay, so does that then have consequences for transmission to feeding larvae? So here on the x-axis, we have that same variable again. This is the mean tissue spirochete load. I forgot to point out earlier that this is on a log scale. So, you know, the absolute values don't, will not mean that much to you. I think just remember that it just, just uh, mice either have higher or lower loads, but the exact numbers won't mean very much to you. Uh, so this is the, the, the abundance again of the strains in those seven tissues of the mice. And then on the y-axis here, we have the percentage of engorged larvae that acquired the infection after taking a blood meal on those mice. And you can see this strong positive relationship. Again, uh, quite straightforward explanation here. Strains that establish higher abundance in their host tissues have better transmission to larvae. Um, so that explains that graph. Next as I said before, what's really critical, right, is, is not, well, it's important that larvae acquire the infection, but remember, we also want to see what's happening once those larvae molt into nymphs, right? So, and then we take those unfed nymphs and test them. And is there variation in that variable, which I refer to as host to tick transmission? And here you see that, again, we see quite a bit of variation. There's some strains that are amazing. They, they, they have very high transmission, close to you know, 100% over the whole lifetime of the infection, right? So at 30, 60, and 90 days post-infection, these strains are infecting 95 to 100% of the ticks that feed on that mouse. There's other strains that have this pattern where they start off pretty well, like strain 66 here, but then by the second infestation, it's down to 50%. And here now it's below 40%. That's still pretty good, uh, but it's not as good as some of these others. So these, uh, it might be useful to remember some of these numbers, 66, 54, and 22-2. They're sort of what I consider are, are wimpier strains that they establish lower uh, pathogen uh, abundance in the tissues of the mice, and they don't have this consistently high transmission. So, you know, all else being equal, we'd expect these strains with these high numbers, 174, 178, 198, they have high transmission over the entire duration of the infection. We would expect those strains to do better, right? Uh, in nature, if we're going to look at, you know, asking the question, which strains are more common, we would expect these strains to be more common than those strains, right? Because they have, they have much better transmission over the lifetime of the infection. Um, so here I've shown you host to tick transmission in the nymphs. Is that correlated with abundance of the spirochetes in the mouse tissues? Yes, it is. So this is very similar to that previous graph that I showed you. Previously, we were looking at the engorged larvae, and now we're looking at once those engorged larvae have molted into nymphs, right? And again, we see the same story. Strains that establish high abundance in the tissues of the mice have highly efficient transmission to larvae, which then molt into nymphs. And so uh, those nymphs now uh, in the next step would have a high probability of infecting the host. So we're seeing this uh, expected. I mean, this relationship was expected. We're excited to get it, but it, it hadn't been shown for uh, Borrelia burgdorferi before. 
Okay, and right, then uh, the next question was, the original question that I asked is, I showed you that when we go to a small patch of forest uh, and we look at the strains that are there, that are in the tick population and the vertebrate host population, we often find a dozen strains or so or more. And I, I said that some of them are much more common than others. So again, the question is, what explains that variation? And as I've just finished saying, we expect these strains that have high abundance in the mice and high transmission, high lifetime transmission, to be more common in nature, right? All else being equal than these strains uh, that have lower uh, lifetime host to tick transmission. And so to answer that question, what did we do? Uh, we got, uh, we went to the literature and there's lots of studies that have been published uh, in North America where people have used that multi-locus uh, sequence typing method that I briefly mentioned earlier to figure out what strains are actually out there in the, in, in the tick population or sometimes in the, um, in the vertebrate host population. So we found two studies that looked at uh, ticks, one, one from Canada, one from the USA. Uh, I think it had a couple hundred, couple hundred strains had been genotyped. And so then uh, we, you know, matched our, the, the genotypes of our strains, the multi-locus sequence types of our strains with the literature uh, and saw what is the frequencies of our strains in nature. Okay, so completely different data set. So this is what we found. Uh, again, we found this positive relationship between Remember, these are our laboratory estimates at the bottom here on the x-axis. Those are laboratory estimates of transmission in a lab mouse population. And on the y-axis here, we have the frequencies of those strains in nature uh, in tick populations, which was estimated by other scientists, right, that we got from the published literature. And so, you know, the line is not as clean as some of the other ones, but we're seeing that these, these three uh, sort of wimpy strains that I talked about earlier, uh, that have low lifetime host to tick transmission. They're also not very common um, out in uh, nature. And then our super strains, 198, uh, 178, that have high abundance in the mice and uh, that, that have high ho lifetime host to tick transmission. Uh, they are uh, among the more common ones. And for those of you that are in the know, this is uh, MLST type three, OSC type K, it's a pr pretty common strain uh, uh, in tick populations and also one that is often found to cause uh, um, disease in Lyme disease patients. So this was exciting to us. And, and also I have to say, maybe not, uh, you know, we were hoping to find this, but we were surprised still because you have to remember, I, I mentioned earlier that there's this is multiple niche polymorphism hypothesis, right? So different strains do better in different hosts has been advanced for, it has been this idea that's been advanced for Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto. And so if that's true, we wouldn't necessarily expect the, the, the house mouse, the lab mouse that we're using here to necessarily be a good indicator of the transmission success that these strains are having in say chipmunks or white-footed mice or raccoons or whatever. Uh, so this study suggests, uh, which is maybe somewhat you know, counterintuitive, uh, for, for if you strongly believe in the multiple niche polymorphism hypothesis, that we can use lab mice uh, as reliable indicators of, of, of strain performance and strain transmission, and then relate that to uh, their estimates of their frequency in, in nature. Okay, um, so yeah, I think I've, I've probably hammered this point home enough uh, about the conclusions. Uh, so I'm going to move on. Um, and uh, what I want to point out uh, is that, uh, be, as I mentioned before, these strains are often circulating in the same tick populations and the same uh, host population. So what's very common is you get hosts that are co-infected with multiple strains. So this is what I mean by that, uh, is you see this mouse here, and it's got two strains. One is strain A and one strain is strain B. And so another thing, a question that we've been interested in answering is how does co-infection influence the transmission of these strains, right? Because they're, they're using, we can assume that they're interested in the same resources, they're interested in the same tissues. So what effect does that have on, on transmission success? 
And I, sh I should point out again that co-infections in vertebrate hosts are really the norm. So there's a number of studies that have looked at this in Europe and, and in North America. And sometimes some studies find that as many as you know, 90% 90, 90 of the hosts are carrying more than one strain. Uh, and then there's some controlled experimental infections that have already uh, suggested that when a mouse is co-infected and then when you get, you have to be transmitted to feeding ticks, that there's going to be a reduction in transmission success. So that suggests that these strains are competing inside the uh, vertebrate host for access to, to, to the ticks. And so we, we also wanted to test that. So uh, this is with, uh, this is back in Neuchatel with um, a PhD student named Dolores Genet. And we just worked with two strains to keep it simple. And we're working here with Borrelia zeliae. So one strain came from Finland. So uh, there's the Finnish flag. So that strain will be uh, colored in blue. The other strain came from Switzerland. There's the Swiss flag, which has red. So that strain will be colored in red. And so we did this very simple experiment where the mice was either infected with a single strain, like the Finnish strain alone, or the mouse was co-infected. And so we're, the prediction here is that in the co-infected mouse, we're gonna see a reduction in transmission. And then we did the mirror image experiment here where the single strain is the Swiss strain. And then again, we have uh, co-infected mice. And the names of these strains are kind of long and cumbersome. FinGiv A3 is the Finnish strain and NE4049, that stands for Neuchatel. Uh, NE stands for Neuchatel. So that's that, that uh, town in Switzerland where I, I, I lived and worked for eight years. So what's, what's gonna happen to uh, transmission, host to tick transmission in this scenario? Well here, first we're gonna talk about the Finnish strain, then we'll talk about the, the Swiss strain. So this is host to tick transmission when the Finnish strain is on its own. It does great, about 90% of the ticks are infected. In contrast, if the Finnish strain has to share the mouse with a Swiss strain, we see this dramatic reduction in transmission. Right, so this is a reduction in the fitness of that strain. This Finnish strain does not like to be in a co-infected mouse with the Swiss strain. In contrast, the Swiss strain shown here in red seems to be largely indifferent to whether the Finnish strain is there or not. So when it's on its own, it does pretty well. It infects 80% of the ticks. And when the Finnish strain is there, it also does pretty well. And the difference is not significant. And this is not uncommon when we do these types of competition experiments for other pathogens is you, or, or other organisms is competition can be asymmetric. One, into, one species can, or strain can be very adversely affected. The other one is uh, largely indifferent. Um, so, but you know, this talk is about abundance. So how does abundance feature into this? Well, we, again, we went after, after we did the transmission experiments, we euthanized the mice, we measured the spirochete loads and their tissues and then looked at what, how sparkit load was related to transmission. And again, we found this pattern. So here, the strains are still color-coded. The Finnish strain is in blue, the Swiss strain is in red. And these data points here, the open data points, refer to the co-infected animals. So what we see here is that the Finnish strain had very low abundance in the tissues of the co-infected mice. And as a result, it had low host to tick transmission. So what I'm saying is that when a strain is on its own, uh, which was the study that was shown by Chris, it wants to have high abundance in order to be transmitted to ticks. When it's in a co-infected host, abundance is still important and it needs to have high abundance in order to uh, get transmitted to ticks. So abundance is important regardless of whether you're on your own or whether you're in a co-infected host. Um, again, um, the, the, I think I've already addressed these uh, conclusions, but uh, yeah, an interesting question is to ask is how, how important is competition between strains in vertebrate hosts in nature? Is that something that is uh, uh, important? And are there some strains that are perhaps better competitors than others? So some strains maybe do quite well on their own, but then they are you know, adversely infected, affected when they're in competition with other strains. So in, I, I don't have very much time left, so I'm gonna um, speed up here with this last bit. So, so up till now, I've mostly been talking about host to tick transmission. The other thing, uh, the other, the, remember there was a second step there, which is transmission from the vector back to the host, right? So that's nymph to host transmission. You'll find there's way fewer studies uh, on that. 
uh, trying to get estimates of that. Part of the reason is it, it requires a lot of work. Uh, this is essentially what you have to do. You have to take a single tick, you have to put it on a mouse and then see whether that mouse becomes infected. But then you have to repeat that lots of times. So here in this uh, situation, uh, we see that you know we have four mice that were challenged with an infected tick. Three of them became infected. I don't know why it's hopping around like that, sorry. And so three of the four mice became infected. So we would say that the probability of transmissions from an infected nymph to the host is uh, 75%. But in order to get good confidence intervals, you probably have to do this for at least 20 mice and maybe up to 40 mice. And then you've just done one strain. So if you want to do 10 strains, you're looking at maybe doing you know, 200 to 400 mice. So it quickly gets uh, pretty prohibitive. Um, and as a result, we don't have very much information about whether this, th this second transmission components from the nymph to the host, does that differ between strains? So we really don't have very much idea. But I wanted to you know, do that with Dolores. So uh, after that first experiment that she did, uh, we then took a lot of those nymphs that she created and then did the second experiment to see whether we could find differences in transmission from the nymph to the host. And we found a surprisingly large difference. So uh, I'm gonna get you to focus right now just on uh, the situation where the engorged challenge nymph is infected. So if the engorged challenged nymph is infected, the finished strain had a probability of 75% of establishing infection in the mouse. In contrast, the Swiss strain had a 50% chance. So that's quite a bit lower. So this finished strain has a 1.6 fold advantage when it comes to that second transmission step from the nymph to the mouse. And you might be uh, surprised to say, well, you're saying that some of these challenges were uninfected, but then the mouse became infected. How does that work? Well, it shows you, I, I mean, all detection systems are imperfect, right? And so uh, obviously these engorged nymphs were infected. It's the only way that the mouse could become infected, but we're unable to detect that when we tested the engorged nymph. And so uh, it's important to remember that when you start testing engorged ticks to tell Lyme disease patients whether they're exposed or not, that there's always quite a bit of uncertainty. So the engorged tick, your PCR test could tell you, oh, that tick was infected, but there was no transmission. That happens quite a bit. Or you could say, oh, the engorged tick wasn't infected, so you're safe, but actually there was, uh, uh, the pathogen was transmitted. So you can get, you can get all those cases. But the main point here that I'm talking about is that nymph to host transmission can uh, differ quite dramatically between strains. And to my knowledge, this is the first time that that's been shown for any Borrelia burgdorferi uh, sensolata pathogen. There've been other attempts, but the sample sizes were so small that it's impossible to say whether there are any meaningful differences. And so what, is this, what does this difference do to this difference in transmission? Well, uh, we can obviously, previously we are talking about the spirochete abundance in the tissues of the mouse. We can do the same thing for the spirochete tissues in the ticks, right? And so when we do that, uh, that's shown here. So we have the age of the nymph um, on the x-axis and then the number of um, um, spirochetes that we detected, again, based on quantitative PCR. And so what you can see is this finished strain, which had this much better nymph to host transmission had a higher spirochete load uh, than the Swiss strain. So the, the situation was a little bit reversed, right? Because if you remember the Swiss strain did better in the host to tick transmission because it uh, generally had higher spirochete loads uh, than the finished strain, especially in the case of competition. Here we're seeing that the finished strain seems to be doing pretty well in the ticks. It has higher abundance in the ticks. And as a result, it seems to have higher uh, nymph to host transmission. I'm gonna skip this slide because we're running out of time. Uh, I wanna just point out, I think this is important, this nymphal spirochete loads, because I'm going back now to Chris's experiment. You see his 11 strains here at the bottom, and he found really big differences in nymphal spirochete loads. So this is after the, the, the larva had taken a meal, they'd molted into nymphs, and then a month later, we kill the nymphs and we test their sparky loads. And you can see that these strains, 198, 174, 178, they have nymphal sparky loads that is about nine times higher than strain 66 and 57. 
And the reason why I think that's important is nymphs spend a lot of time in the environment waiting. They're not getting new food sources. So I think that sparkeet load population is sort of shrinking, shrinking, dying inside the nymphal tick. And then if you start off with a, with a sparkeet population that's 10 times bigger, then when you start feeding, I think you're more likely to be able to transmit spirochetes um, to, to your host. So I think this is something that, that, that is really worth uh, investigating more. So um, the conclusions about this last section, strains uh, can differ in this second transmission components from the infected nymph to uh, the uninfected host. Um, I think it's perhaps related to the spirochete load in the nymphs, we saw that the finished strain had a much higher spirochete load and had much higher transmission. Uh, when you start looking at this, you realize that the age of the nymph is important because the spirochete load seems to decline over time in these unfed nymphs. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, so I hope the, the point of this talk was to show you the importance of abundance uh, for both of those transmission components. So abundance in the mouse is important for host to take transmission. Abundance in the tick is important for tick to host transmission. I hope I, hope I managed to show that. I wanna thank uh, the PhD students that did this work, the technicians, our many collaborators, and uh, I wanna thank the funders. And finally, I wanna thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Vorda, for your uh, fantastic presentation today. I'm gonna to check the chat box to see if there's any questions been typed in. I haven't seen any questions in the chat box. So I'm going to go to the audience. If you would like to ask Dr. Bordeaux a question, please raise your hand icon and we're happy to start the Q&A segment. Lots of applause claps I see. Does anybody have a question? Oh, go ahead, Dr. Kalati. We'll start with you. Uh, thanks. Uh, sorry, Martin, I missed the first part of your talk. I was, came late from another meeting, but um, it was in, really interesting to see um, perspective about the um, challenges of doing, you know, these many mouse studies to really get a good sense of uh, transmission. Maybe think about, um, you know, whether there might be some role for uh, sort of, um, you know, like natural surveys of both ticks and rodent populations, and then using these mice as a way to validate those results rather than as the uh, you know, the basis for, for those transmission. I don't know if you, if you thought about like sort of that connection to the, the more ecology side of the, of the, of the data. No, I, I think that would be great. Uh, you know, uh, going out, uh, capturing white-footed mice or other uh, wildlife hosts. And then you can do two things. You can go with the ticks that are already naturally attached, or you could actually you know, uh, if you buy larval ticks, you can get larval ticks from the University of Oklahoma that are uninfected. You could put some of those larvae on them and then and then look at the transmission, right? So I think that would be extremely informative. Again, you, you have to be a little bit careful uh, because say, say you have a host that's co-infected with strain A and strain B, uh, you know, it might've had strain A for a while, strain B might've come later. Uh, so that could influence um, transmission success. And we don't, we don't have a very good understanding of how the order of infection, like if a host gets one strain followed by the other, uh, what ecologists call priority effects, how that's going to influence transmission. But that would be very worthwhile. And I, I think if we were to do that, and you know, there's, there is some data out there, like my postdoctoral supervisor did stuff like that. Um, I think that some of these, again, some of these strains that that we see are common out there based on their um, uh, you know, multi-locus sequence type. I think those strains would probably also show, you know, good good transmission to feeding ticks. So I think that's an excellent suggestion. Thanks. Great. Right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Arne, I see that Terry's got her hand up and then Loki, uh, Snyman, and then we've got one more question in the chat box that I see. So we have at least three more questions. Uh, Terry, go ahead. Uh, just a quick one, and you may not know it, but I'm just wondering with the infection load, if it's high, can it be passed to offspring? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually have a student, uh, Alexandra, and we are um, working on, or we've, we've, we're doing a study looking at whether uh, maternal antibodies 
um, protect offspring against uh, infectious challenge. So we infected moms with Lyme disease and then let the mice have babies and then uh, challenge those babies uh, to see whether the maternal antibodies would be protective. And in that study, we were able to confirm that um, prior to the infectious challenge, none of the babies had uh, spirochetes. And, and if you look at the literature on mice, I'm, I, I'm just sticking here to mice, um, there isn't uh, much evidence that there is transmissions from mother to offspring. But it's interesting and it's curious because um, there's a very closely related group of Borrelia called relapsing fever Borrelia. So Borrelia miyamotoi, which we have in Canada, is an example of that. And, and they're closely related, right? They're sister clades. You have the Lyme disease bacteria and you have the relapsing fever bacteria. And the relapsing fever bacteria have very good mother to offspring transmission. And in Africa, where some of these relapsing fever spirochetes are very common, it's a major problem uh, that, that moms who are infected transmit the sparky. So it, it, it's very interesting that um, Borrelia burgdorferi does not seem to have very efficient uh, transmissions from mother to offspring. In, I, again, I'm limiting myself to mice, but the evidence is also not very extensive for humans. And it probably is partly to do with the fact that they don't spend a lot of time in the blood right? Like initially when the infection is disseminating, yes, you can find spirochetes in the blood, but their preferred tissue is really the skin. Lyme disease spirochetes like to hang out in the skin because that's where they'll get transmitted from. In contrast, relapsing fever spirochetes, they're like malaria. They need to be in the blood. And it's again, partly related to the vector. A lot of those vectors are soft ticks that only feed for a very short period of time. So you have to have a presence in the blood to get transmitted. Lyme disease depends on heart ticks that feed for three to five days. So you can hang out in the skin at low density. So I think that's, that's a difference between those two, uh, two uh, groups of spirochetes and the risk of mother offspring uh, transmission. And we hope, to, we hope to add that study to the literature in the near future. And I hope I answered your question. Thank Thanks you very so much. Thanks so much, Terry. Uh, go ahead, Loki. Hi, Martin. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I was just wondering, you say abundance is very important in the nymph. So uh, acquiring a huge load and then the load sort of dissipates over time or, or reduce over time in the nymph. Is that due to the nymph's own immune response? And by extension, then, is Borrelia then having an effect on the fitness of ticks itself? So is it an infection of ticks as well? Um, was just wondering if there's any information on that. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, there's not much evidence that Borrelia reduces the fitness of ticks. Not many studies have been done on it, but the few that have uh, have not found strong effects. Um, and uh, trying to think uh, what else to say. So, so that's that's the first point. Um, and I think, you know, part of the reason why ticks are su such permissive vectors is they have, they, they do their digestion very different uh, than, than many other animals. Uh, so they have intracellular digestion, right? They don't secrete a whole bunch of digestive enzymes into their gut lumen. So the spirochetes can just sort of hang out there and uh, the tick, you know, takes little bits of blood and brings it in and then digests it intracellularly. So that spark and that spirochete population, it's also not that big. Uh, you know, maybe it's like 10,000 spirochetes. So I once published a paper where we calculate, we tried to calculate the energetic requirements, like how much does it cost to maintain the spirochete population? And it's really minimal. Like it's like less than, you know, 1% of the energy budget. Uh, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not sure how accurate those, those, those calculations were, but I think really the, the cost of a Borrelia infection for a tick is really minor. You're talking about a sparky population of maybe 10,000 individuals. So I think the reason why it decreases over time is just there's no, there's no input of new nutrients into that midgut, right? So the, 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 the blood meal only degrades more over time and more of it is brought back in and maybe some of the spirochetes are even brought into the digestive system and then degraded that way. We don't have a very good understanding of uh, 
why that spirochete population degrades over time in the NIF, but it seems pretty intuitive. There's no new nutrients coming in uh, until it takes another blood meal, right? So, and, and then we typically see when that does happen. So when that nymph does feed, then all of a sudden there's a, there's a explosion in the spirochete population. So the, the, the spirochete population is kind of hanging tough for all those months that the nymph is out there in the environment, uh, just first overwintering and then looking for a host. Uh, and yeah, I think that's why it declines over time. There's just no, no new nutrient input. It could only go down. Thanks. Thank you, Loki, for your question. Uh, we have a question in the chat box, and then I will go to Twyla. Uh, thanks so much for your awesome talk, Martin. In Canada, how much do you think the genetics of the tick itself plays into transmission success? The genetics of the tick. Uh... Yeah, wow. I, I I wouldn't know too much about that. Um, I I mean, these ticks, the black-legged ticks that have come to Canada, they've obviously come from the U.S. Uh, populations, and I'm not too aware of studies that have shown, you know, the 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 in the U.S. There's quite distinct populations. Let's say the southern U.S. and northeastern and midwestern. Those tick populations are distinct. And I know they differ in their questing behavior quite significantly, but I'm not sure if there have been studies showing that, um, you know, different geographic populations in the USA differ with respect to their reservoir competence. So I, 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 my guess would be that all the black-legged ticks that we have in Canada are all pretty similar. And I don't, I don't think that would explain a lot of the variation in transmission, but I'm just speculating. So, sorry. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Okay, go ahead, Twyla, over to you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, my question is related to the uh, asking about the relationship between uh, the load of the spirochete in the host and the robustness or variation of the immune system of the host and how those impact one another and how that would impact you know what you've achieved in your conclusions well so in this particular study right the hosts that we're using are are c3h hej mice they're highly inbred uh so there probably isn't that much genetic variation there's always some uh you know charles jackson will tell you there's none but there, <laughs> there there's always some variation but so that's why because we're using a very you know inbred homogeneous host. Um, I think most of the variation that we're seeing is due to the pathogen uh, to the different strains. And that's why we did the study that way. Um, but with respect to, you know, if you go out in nature, there's many different reservoir hosts and they differ very dramatically, right, in their ability to sustain infections and transmit. So hosts like uh, you know, we don't have them here so much, but in the U.S., uh, Virginia possums uh, are terrible at transmitting Borrelia. They do seem to be infected because they, they manage to infect some ticks, but the percentage of ticks that acquired infections from feeding on Virginia possums like less than 2%. Same, same with a lot of the small carnivores, raccoons, skunks, not good hosts. White-footed mice, amazing hosts, 90%, um, uh, you often see 90% transmission um, so, so here in our, for this study, we're pretty confident that, you know, we minimized variation due to the host and that what we're seeing is, is variation due to the strain, but definitely in the field, uh, host factors are going to, uh, play an important role. Yeah. So is there much research going on that is looking at that question? The, um, how immune system variability in immune systems impact uh, transmission and infection? Well, the major, you mean among different animal host species? Like the, yeah. all the, yes. yes, yeah. So the major problem with, with doing that research is getting the animals, right? There's Charles Jackson can't sell you uh, clean uh, skunks that are not infected. You know, they, the, Charles Jackson sells mice, rats, and that's about it. So, so that's the major problem is, is um, and again, Rob Kowati alluded to this earlier, can you do research in wildlife? Uh, yes, you can, you can capture wildlife and, and people have done that. 
But the, the, the major reason why this, this whole business of the multiple niche polymorphism, in my opinion, is still very much unresolved, like the importance of strain, uh, different hosts for different strains, is because we can't do the experimental infection studies. I mean, we, we, technically we can do them, but we don't have, we can't source the animals. You can't get a bunch of uninfected raccoons and a bunch of uninfected skunks and a bunch of uninfected squirrels. And, and even if you could, that work would be very expensive and difficult to do. So that's why, you know, we're I would have much preferred to have done this study in Paramiscus leucopus. And people would say it would have been a much better study had I done it in a white-footed mouse. And that's, that is possible. You can't actually buy a white-footed mouse, but it just adds a whole level of difficulty. But you're absolutely right. We should be doing that. If we wanna know, understand how different strains are being transmitted through different animals, we should be doing experimental infections with, with wildlife. Yeah. Thank you so much, Twyla, for your questions. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Vorda for taking the time today to give his presentation. Um, and I also want to let everybody know that we are continuing our talks next week. We do have five presentations uh, kicking off next week on Monday, May the 8th at one o'clock is a talk by Dr. Nick Ogden, who will be discussing Lyme disease emergence with climate change. What will be the economic burden for Canada? So hopefully you can join us on Monday. Again, a reminder to take part in our challenge, wear green, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness of Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. You can also send photos of your creative artwork, um, you know, pottery, drawing, sketches that express Lyme disease and tick-borne disease awareness event. All photos received will be automatically entered into our draw for one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. And you can send your uh, photos to Clydern at gmail.com and our draw will occur on the last day on May 31st. And finally, just to let you know that we are having TickNet Canada's inaugural scientific symposium in person in Toronto, Ontario this fall, October 24th, 25th. Many of you are probably wondering, what is TickNet Canada? Well, the current network, the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network, is going to be evolving and starting a new network with a number of researchers from our current network, as well as um, others from across Canada and hoping to join new members. Um, and we're going to kick off with a scientific symposium. Uh, we're hoping to open registration and abstract submission later this month. So we hope to have some more news to share with you uh, later on this month as we wrap up our Lyme disease events. So again, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Dr. Vordo, for your presentation today. And we hope you have a great rest of your week and great upcoming weekend. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Veronica. Bye-bye.